Well, uh, hello. Nice to see all of your smiling faces. Uh, my name is Matt, as previously mentioned. I am the worship department director here at Bethel Church as well as, I mean, I, I lead worship and do some writing and stuff as well. So today I am going to be talking about overseeing and running and managing a worship department. So depending on where you're at, as far as the size of your team, some things may apply to you, some may not. Um, as it is here at the church, we have about 90 musicians and singers that I, uh, I will schedule and, well, hold hands with. <laughs> hey, um, you know, buddy, I sent you that request to play like, you know, a few months ago and you still haven't confirmed and it's tomorrow. Are you going to play? You are? Okay. Okay, we're good. So if you're on the team here, I'm probably not specifically talking about you. Uh, probably not. But that's, uh, that's one of the joys of scheduling a really large team. Everybody has busy lives, and it's easy to overlook things. So I came to Bethel in 2009. I actually started just like this. I came to the School of Worship that year. And uh, liked it so much, I stuck around and got involved with worship and then got brought on to the worship department about two years ago and then last year got brought on as the uh, department manager and kind of running things. Uh, Brian and Jen oversee the worship department. They are the, they are the smiling faces and I am the arms and the legs and the fists of punishment if necessary, which I'm really good at, as you can guess, because of my obvious athletic build. And you can't tell, but I actually have a, I've got a black belt underneath this shirt. So, so um, I'm going to cover just a, a few things today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how our department is set up and how it runs. And then I'm going give, to give you guys some, some pointers Primarily, I'm going to be talking about how, like, good, good ways, good systems, good things to keep in mind for running a department, because it's it can be it can be really tricky, and we're still learning because no one has the whole picture. So the way the basic structure of our department uh, started hinting at it. Brian and Jen are the heads of the department, and uh, with advisement from Joel Taylor, who is in charge of the record label, who oversees that for them. And, uh, and then I am the worship team uh, manager. And with a, we have a, hand, a couple of employees. Uh, my friend Paul McClure is uh, one of the other guys who's helping out, as well as he works for Worship You. And between the two of us, then we are doing the scheduling and the administration of the department. We have, was it, seven services every weekend? And so that's a lot of musicians to schedule. And the way we have it set up right now, we have a Friday night team. We have a band that plays all three of our morning services here at our main campus, which they are, just Lord bless them. They are saints. And uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of playing. That's three services. They're here from uh, 7 a.m., until usually 1.30 playing music. So it is a lot of work, but it, but it works. And then we have leaders lead the first two services and a different leader. Different leaders will come in for the 1 p.m. service. We have our Sunday night team. And then we have, which hopefully is a different team than the team that played all morning. But sometimes, if you guys do any kind of scheduling, you'll know that can be really crazy sometimes and you just can't avoid some things. And then we have uh, our secondary campus, which has two morning services, and when the school's going, has an evening service as well. So we're quite busy, very busy scheduling and texting people and calling people and very likely begging people, please, please play. So in that, we also have, what we have uh, is section leaders. We have a couple of people that are in charge of their particular department, uh, like their musical instrument department. So we have like Michael Pope, who's been up here almost every day playing, and Bobby, the two guitar players. They, are, they oversee all of our electric guitar players, 
and they make sure that they're learning parts and they're helping them with gear, helping them with tone. And um, we have that for drums and keys, etc. So that's the whole idea is to have, like when you have a big team, you can't do everything yourself. So finding great ways to delegate keeps you from burning out. Because if I had to do everything myself, I wouldn't be able to. So it wouldn't, wouldn't work really well. So we've got those sort of structures. We have a few basic requirements for being a part of the team. We have a monthly community meeting, which I believe we're actually having in here next week, next Thursday night, that uh, here, and I think everybody gets to come to that. Don't quote me on that, but they'll talk about that next week, I'm sure. Uh, so we have that once a month. It's usually like an hour and a half or so, two hours, where we hang out and then talk about whatever's going on within the department, new like announcements, um, change of protocol, things like that. And then we, here's a, here's a shocker, we ask our team to go to church. And uh, so that's one of the other requirements. If you're going to play on our worship team, a church worship team, we want you to go to church. And uh, it's, it's, it's out there. But, and then basic like other requirements are like character and those sorts of things, which I'll get into in a little bit. So once you, uh, once you have your worship team assembled, it's good to start getting, finding some way to get organized. And there's a lot of great tools for scheduling out there. We use a planning center online. There are a handful of other ways you can do it as well. I think that there's been a lot of programs that have popped up to do that same sort of thing, uh, like worshipteam.com. Uh, you could even use something like Google Calendar if you wanted to as well for scheduling. But finding a way to get everybody into a database so that you can very easily email everyone on the team as opposed to having to text everyone. If you have a smaller team, that's really easy. You know, you text the drummer, the bass player, the guitar player, and your flute player, and you're good. And uh, then, you know, you're set. I came from a church just like that. So before I was here, like we had a little tiny church. If I didn't show up, no one played electric guitar. And, you know, I was the only guitar player, and it was just rhythm, so there was no lead. Um, sometimes we had a bass player, sometimes we had a keys player. It was just, it's the real deal. I understand the struggle. And then it's actually really good if you haven't created a requirement for your team. This is what we want from you to be a part of this. It's actually really good because what that does is that helps set up expectations for your team so they know this is what is expected of me if I'm going to be a part of this. So things like a value system. Like we have, um, there's a lot of things on our own value system. I mentioned it already. One of the big ones is character. Because whether or not someone likes it, if they're on stage, they're viewed as a leader. Because people are going to see them on stage, and then if they see them out smoking, getting drunk at the bar, that's obviously going to create a problem. So we've created a character, sort of some guidelines character systems, things like that, so that people know, hey, I'm a leader, therefore, I need to act like a leader, because what I'm doing off of stage reflects my leadership. So if I'm setting a bad example off of stage on the weekends, whenever, like if, let's say, if I personally do something stupid out there that makes a mess, I'm creating a mess then for my leadership. I've made a mess for Brian and Jen, and indirectly... Bill, Chris, all the other leaders that I look up to and respect so much, my actions have created a mess for them. So it's a respect sort of thing. So having good character is one of our primary, primary things and valuing character over someone's ability. Because you can have someone who's super talented, but if all they're doing is making messes, well then, hmm, that's, uh, that's a really unfortunate sort of setup. And I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about that in particular because that's a really hot topic, I realize. A lot of people want to know, what do I do with this and that and this guy over here doing these sorts of things? I go, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes. Another thing is growth. One of our other values that we have is growth, both spiritual growth and musical growth because there's always somewhere else to go, you know? You never reach, you've never fully arrived because of the fact that there's always something else to learn and both musically speaking and spiritually speaking. We don't want people to 
thrive musically, but then not be growing spiritually. We want it to be a steady progression. So creating like a value system like that, that's clearly communicated to your team. These are the things we want from you. Helps a ton because then there's, it eliminates a lot of questions and it eliminates a lot of potential messes. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to be smoking marijuana in the back parking lot because you never said I couldn't. So I just assumed it was okay. That hasn't happened here. So you'll obviously need to tailor the needs for your specific church as well, though obviously different churches have different like value systems. I'm not talking about marijuana now. Hopefully that we're all on the same page with that. I mean, if you're in Washington or Colorado, then there's, you know, maybe that's, that's a whole different subject that you have to cover since it's legal there. That's very interesting. I don't, I don't envy you that argument. So, so you need to tailor it for your particular church, for your own needs, and for the, the strengths and the core values of the house as well, because you obviously, if you're part of a church, then you're under that church's covering, and therefore you want to honor what your church is, what your church stands for. So through that, you're setting expectations. Like I said, eliminates messes, and everyone feels better. Like when someone says, hey, this is what I'm expecting of you, Please go here, 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 and do these things when you're there. Everyone feels better than if you were told, oh, yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. And like, wait, what, what, am I, what am I doing? No, you're great. Go ahead. It really helps. I mean, I function really well when I have, like, guidelines and, like, things set up because then I know exactly what's expected of me, which is why I think it's such a good idea to have it set up that way. Um, and then one of the really big things that you want is to find a way for your team to really feel more like a family than it is like an organization, you know? Because you want, like you want, it to, you want people to feel like they belong to something and that they're valuable and that what they carry is important and that there's not some, um, that they're just being used for their, for their abilities. And, and uh, you want to have people feel like they have a way to grow. That's one of the reasons that we have the section leaders set up is so that our musicians are constantly growing. That's why we have our community meetings where we're praying for each other and, and people are giving testimonies about what the Lord's doing in their lives and uh, we're taking prayer requests like, hey, I've got this terrible thing going on. This is really hard. I need you guys to, to pray with me because there's really strength in numbers when it comes to all of that stuff. So giving people somewhere to go and being a part of your body, being a part of your community should be mutually beneficial. So you want, obviously you're going to gain when someone is able to, to play for you. Like I really understand that scheduling. It, it can get really crazy, but having someone be a part, like it obviously is super helpful when somebody is able to play fill in at the last second, all that stuff is super important, but you don't want to create a system where it, people just feel like they're being used. You want them to be able to benefit from, from being a part of it. And that's, that all comes back to, to the growth, both musical and spiritual growth. That's why it's so important is because it takes care of so many things. It creates value for individuals. It gives them somewhere to go. It helps people from becoming stagnant. And it, uh, in all of that, it finds ways, like it's finding a way to show value to your people, which is obviously really important. And uh, I mean, there's always the question of, well, do we pay our musicians? Do we not pay our musicians? That's really, that's really up to you. And um, we pay our musicians for conferences and we will sometimes have jobs and different things that we will have people do for us. Um, and that's just the particular way that we have it set up here. But some people have a stipend for their musicians or they will bring in musicians from all over. I know some churches will like hire musicians per service and they pay them for that. Uh, my only concern when it comes down to whether or not to pay a musician is it becomes a question of motivation. It's like, why are you here? Are you here because you're getting a paycheck? Or are you here because you want to be a part of all of this? And that's the whole, that's kind of the huge debate for 
everyone, do we pay, do we not pay? That's usually what comes down to obviously finances and what is, what's then the motivation going to be. So you just have to decide that on your own, you know, with I don't have any great, like this is the way you have to do it because it's all dependent on where you're at. And uh, another huge part of running a department is being a good leader. Like you want to become the leader that you would want to follow. Someone who listens, someone who is empowering, someone who is encouraging. There's a couple, I think there's like two basic forms of leadership, like motivations to follow someone. There's either love or there's fear. I've, I've led, um, I've worked for some people whose leadership style was do this so you can avoid my wrath. And the amount of joy you can have in that sort of environment is, is pretty limited, um, very honestly. I, I hate it. Those are my least favorite jobs. If you're avoiding being punished all the time, it's, you're always looking over your shoulder, and I hope no one's watching what I'm doing right now. Or feeling like you're feeling like obligated by fear to perform as opposed to, you know what? I love this person so much. I will do anything for them because they value me. They've shown me value, so I will show them value. So it then becomes very important to lead by love and not by fear of punishment. We've tried really hard to create an environment for people where it's okay if people mess up, if they make a mistake. Obviously, there are consequences. Um, you know, it all depends on the type of mistake that's made. But if you have an environment of acceptance, an environment of love, I mean, people tend to, it, it just creates so much more safety for people if they do make a mistake. Or even, again, it comes down to, I love this person so much that I'm actually going to avoid making this mess because I know of how much it will affect them. One of the biggest things that you can do as a leader is to communicate well. Because nothing shows value like communication. Or nothing shows a lack of value like no communication. Communication is probably the biggest way to prevent wounds and to heal wounds. However, bad communication or no communication is probably the best way to create wounds. A lot of us will... I know communication, like we call it brave communication here in the Bethel world. Uh, a lot of us are not used to communicating, particularly if it's a difficult subject. It's not awesome to sit down with someone and say, hey, we have to take you off the team. I've, I've had to do that, and it's not, it's not fun. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it never, it's never really easy. Uh, you can get used to it, though. I haven't had to do it very often, and I'm, I'm glad that I haven't had to do it very often because of how much fun it was the times I did. But if you, if you continue to, if you have a problem and you're avoiding having that conversation, it actually doesn't get better. The longer you go without communicating, the more difficult it becomes. And so we, uh, we tend to... Uh, like, well, I think I'm just not going to schedule him forever. And eventually, he'll get so frustrated that he quits the team, which is what I want. I want him to quit the team so I don't have to fire him. And, but you don't realize that in that whole thing, he's sitting there going, why am I not getting scheduled? I must have done something wrong. I must have done something wrong. And, and then the, all these questions start rising in that person's heart. Like, maybe they just don't value me or maybe they just you know they don't like what I do and so in you know our avoidance of communicating it can create so many wounds because the person doesn't know what's going on because we haven't told them what's going on so then they assume something's wrong We're like you know the whole worry thing sets in and uh that can all be avoided by hey this is not this is not really working for us. What do you think? You know, this is, this is what things feel like. In communication, it's really important 
in this sort of communication or just communication in general, it's really important to, uh, there's a few things. We, we love using the phrase, I feel like, or this feels like, finding ways that don't sound like accusational. You always do this, you do that, this is what you've been doing. And like the tone, it, the tone is such a, it sets the, the pace for everything. If it's, I feel like you're not really interested in being on the team because of these sorts of things. Now, that's the way I'm receiving it, but what are you thinking? Like, what's, well, how are you feeling in all of this? Because this is what it might suggest to me, but I wanted to ask you about it. So what's going on? So you're asking questions about it rather than accusing because when it's all accusations, it's like it's not up for discussion. And I mean, while some things aren't up for discussion, like, no, you can't stay on the team. I'm sorry. This, it, it just, there is no way that you can stay on the team. This is the decision that we've made. However, you know, having that whole conversation so you can hear their end, so they can hear you, so you can come to an understanding, is it's absolutely the healthiest way and it is the, the most Christ-like way. And since we're basically talking about it, let's go ahead and let's talk about discipline because we're, we're sort of hinting at that. The, uh, this is ever the popular subject. Okay, well... I've got this guy on my team. We'll just call him Johnny. And I'm pretty sure he's been sleeping around because he comes to church with a different girl. She's dressed very strangely. Every, every, all of them, they're all dressed strangely. One time they were here all together. It was really weird. And he always smells like marijuana when he comes in. And um, I just don't, I don't think that he's a Christian. What do I do? But he's also the only drummer we have. It's not a real struggle. So the question then becomes, what do we do? What's more important in this situation? Having a rhythm section or having a pimp? <laughs> and, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, a, a lot of times you're just going to have to ask the Lord because there's two ways you can look at it. You can say, You're only, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Like if I've got somebody back there who's got a list of issues, you know, like I think he just got out of jail. That looks like a prison tattoo. That's a prison tattoo, yeah. And, and he's got all these things that he's got all these issues going and he's back there. We're trying to lead worship, but he's back there. Is he creating a stink in the incense of worship that's going up before the Lord? Like, the real, the real question is, this is kind of the approach that we take. Obviously, if there's somebody who's got a lot of issues going on, we have taken people either completely off the team or we've put people on breaks. Here's the real distinguishing factor is where's their heart? If I have somebody who has an issue which we have. People always have issues. That's just part of life. The disciples had issues. You want to read, some, read about some issues? Like Jesus was not afraid of people having issues. He chose some real winners when he came to picking disciples. And, um, but he saw where their hearts were at. So we're not looking for people who are completely perfect, but we are looking for people who are willing to grow. If you're not willing to work through your stuff, then that's where we really have a problem. If they have, they're making huge messes, then we're going to take them off either way. If you want to work through your stuff, great, you can do that from the front row. And we will we'll set up like a plan for them. This is how, this is what the path to restoration looks like. We want you to do this, we want to do that, but only if you want to. Like here's, that's another thing is you can tell people you need to do this to get better, but if they don't want to get better, they're not going to do those things. That's why we often, if, if the situation comes up like that, it's always the question of, do you want to get better? You obviously have a problem. Do you want to get better? If you love 
being unhealthy more than you love the idea of becoming healthy, that's fine. You don't have to grow for us. But if you want to grow, then we can work with you. And that's sort of the approach that we've, we've been taking. And so it really comes down to choosing in your own situation, you know, where do I draw the lines? And do we kick this person off? Do we keep them? Ask the Lord about it. And also like ask, is this person going to go to jail if the police find out what's happened? I mean, we, we've, we've, had, we've had that situation before. So um, we, we've had all kinds of things and that's just how it is. When you have a big community of people, particularly musicians who are very wounded and very sensitive, they can be. Not everyone's wounded. I'm just say, but when you're creative, there does sometimes tend to be more of a uh, sensitivity where you can tend to carry wounds a lot particularly childhood wounds. I, can, I could teach a whole other lesson about that in my own life. But um, you, you have to weigh like the consequences and then make the best decision. But it always needs to be motivated by love, not by, not by fear. And that needs to be from your own, your own heart. This seems like the best move because it seems wise. It's not fear-based, it's love-based because I know if I put this person on break, they're going to grow from it. And it's not, I'm afraid they might make a mistake, so I'm just gonna. So it always is really important then to give them the choice. And then this, just to tag onto that, because I've had a lot of people ask me about this. Well, what do you do about people who are Christians or not Christians? Can you let non-Christians onto your team? Again, it comes down to that, to that same question, because... It's sort of like, what's the Lord doing on this, this person's heart? You know, if, if they are Steve, the guy with the prison tattoos who just got out yesterday and he's just a hardened criminal, then I wouldn't probably recommend him being on the team. However, you could bring him into some of your other things and see what happens. Like, oh yeah, we're all hanging out and singing hymns and holding hands. Would you like to come? And then you can see where building relationship takes you. Otherwise, sometimes, I mean, sometimes the Lord is moving really strongly on someone who's not a Christian. And he's like, well, he plays drums. He's fantastic at drums. I'm using drums as an example a lot. It's no, there's no reason for it. Um, if you're a drummer, I'm not picking on you. If you're one of our drummers, I'm not picking on you. And uh, he's really good. And you know what? I really feel like the Lord's doing something on his heart. And that's where you would have to figure that out and maybe ask your leadership. Obviously, you know, you're, if you have good communication between your pastor and yourself, then you can, you can say, hey, um, what do you think? He's not a Christian, but the Lord's doing something clearly. Can we have him play? And kind of go from there or maybe even just set up like good expectations beforehand between yourself and the pastor. So the pastor says, yeah, I'm just not comfortable if they're not a Christian. They haven't been a Christian for 10 years and have a certificate from a Bible college that says that they are a certified Christian. Then I'm not okay with them being on up on stage. And if that's the expectation, well, then that's the expectation. And you need to honor that because that's what's been you're under that leadership. And, you know, there's always room to discuss things. But that also comes back to setting up your core values so that, you know, when questions arise like that, that's always a good time where you can say, okay, great, this question has come up. Let's make this sort of part of our value system. That way there's no questions next time if this happens a second time. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I think that just about summarizes everything. I hope that that was very beneficial for all of you.